So what do I mean by everyday freedom? I mean freedom from emotional reactivity, freedom from pattern thought and pattern thinking, freedom from just basically doing the same old thing over and over again without thinking about it too much. This kind of everyday emotional <coughs> freedom is available to absolutely all of us across the lifespan. There's some differences depending on developmental readiness for young children, but basically by tapping into these universal qualities and with training and practice, by building our ability to recognize them, tap into them and extend them, we're able to free ourselves from emotional thinking, uh, emotional reactivity and pattern thinking in order to make choices that are smart and in the best interests, not just of ourselves, but of everyone around us. Now in uh, presentations like this one, and you're gonna get a lot of practical tools in this presentation. In presentations like this one, we tend to focus on the helpful uh, and the benefits of mindfulness and awareness, how it helps develop executive functioning, how it helps us have a more broad and expansive mindset, how it helps us care and connect with other people. And Kimberly, I believe, is going to give us some research ab around that, which is extremely important, especially in the public sphere and especially in schools. We need to have evidence base, base for this work so that it makes sense to devote our very limited resources, both financial and time in the schools. And Kimberly has done amazing work together with the Dalai Lama Center to continue the march forward in building the scientific base. But there's one piece that I want to suggest right up front that is an extremely important part of mindfulness and meditation. And it's something that we heard about in the previous TED Talk about nature. It's the experience of mindfulness. The helpfulness is very important, but there's an experience of mindfulness that is one of the reasons that seekers have sought contemplative training for millennia. The experience of mindfulness is a little bit like an aha moment. It's that moment we heard in the TED Talk earlier where uh, the young boy didn't feel separate from the pond, right? How many of you have had a feeling like that? There are aha moments where we feel like our sense of self drops away, and we don't feel separate from anyone and anything for a second, but we can't really put words to it. It's not really a conceptual, conceptual thought, it's a feeling. So it's that experience of mindfulness that also gives us the deep, genuine, lasting uh, sense of calm that is the title of this conference. So in this presentation, we'll talk about the helpfulness of mindfulness and also the experience of mindfulness and how we can integrate that everyday freedom into our daily lives. Now, I've said before, and I'm going to say throughout this whole presentation, that these universal qualities that we're talking about can be trained. That's the exciting part. They can be learned, and they can develop and trained. How? By developing a, uh, qualities that fall under the general umbrella of attention, balance, and compassion. So we develop attention, balance, and compassion, and then we utilize those qualities in our everyday life. And that's by developing six social, emotional, and academic life skills, focusing, quieting, seeing, reframing, caring, and connecting. Now notice in this graphic, focusing is at the center and the circle is a little bit bigger, right? That's because we need focus, we need strong attention to be able to utilize these other life skills of quieting, quieting an overly excited nervous system, seeing what's happening in and around us clearly, reframing when that makes sense, and it makes an awful lot of sense for all of us, right? We all have biases, some we know, some we don't know, and sometimes we need to notice what we're thinking and then look at it from a different perspective. And when we're working with kids especially, it's helpful to acknowledge our ch the children's feelings and how the children is viewing something, and then make some suggestions for ways that they might be able to reframe their perspective. And what do we reframe towards? Always through caring and connecting. <coughs> and we do this through a process of inner work. And the inner work we do is we just sit 
or stand or lie down or move. It's not always sedentary as we saw this morning in our exercise. And we notice all of the thoughts, all of the emotions, all the sensations that come and go in our mind. That's it. We just become more familiar with the activity of our minds, knowing some of it will be pleasant, some of it will be unpleasant, some of it will be neutral, which may be okay or maybe a little bit boring. All of it is just part and parcel of being a human being. But the inner work alone works to a point, but we have found that it works better when it's bookended by motivation and an action. So let's talk a little bit first about motivation. Motivation in the way that I'm using it and in the way that it is uh, often talked about in classical contemplative traditions. Now, just so you know, I was a lawyer for 20 years and now I've been teaching mindfulness to children, teens, and, and now mostly adults, uh, training them in how to teach mindfulness in children and teens. But that 20 years as a lawyer got me very, very, very well trained in the importance of this work, being secular, making sure that the language is secular, and making sure that everything that we bring into the schools is as evidence-based as possible, given the newness of the field, and that it is uh, secular and appropriate across cultures, across traditions. But I was trained and I still study in classical contemplative traditions because there's so, so much from those traditions, as we know from the Dalai Lama Center, that we can bring into this work and all of the work that they've done and then translate it into words and practices that are secular and fit in our modern secular world. And in that classical tradition, motivation is an important aspect of this training. It's the first thing we do when we start to practice meditation. Motivation in the way that we're using that word is very similar to the word purpose and meaning. So if we have a purpose and a meaning about bringing mindfulness into our lives or meditation into our lives, that first piece has a way of, help. it's a little bit like the yeast that makes the bread rise. It helps make the process work better. And in the contemplative tradition in which I was mostly trained, the purpose or the motivation as to help other people. And I think you find when you look at the purpose and meaning that is really outlined by, by most people when they talk about what their own purpose is or what their own meaning is uh, or what their motivation might be in the context of classical training, there's a common denominator in that it's not self-centered. It may be to help yourself to be sure, but it's also to help other people too. Now this is very good news if you're a caregiver, and it's very good news if you, like me, spend almost all of your waking hours working with or creating materials for caregivers to help them integrate mindfulness and meditation into their own life. Why? Because caregivers very rarely take time out for themselves. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Caregivers very rarely prioritize their own well-being. And caregivers, parents especially, will often say, now, I am not going to go sit in a cushion in a, in, a, in a small room away from my family. I'm far better off engaging with my family, relating with my family, or out there making money or doing projects or doing chores around the house. This is just not where my priorities are right now. But what if we turn that on its head? What if we tell caregivers what actually is the truth? That if we can take a little time out to lower our own shoulders, to just settle a little bit and get to know our minds a bit better, and if by doing that we become just a little less neurotic, just a little less reactive, our fuse gets a little bit longer, then it benefits absolutely everybody around us. So that way, our own personal self-care has a ripple effect and it affects absolutely everybody that we come into contact with. So let's go back to the idea of inner work now. We know what our motivation is, it's to be helpful, to be helpful to ourselves, to be sure, but also to be helpful to everybody around us. And so we're gonna to get to know our minds better. And when we get to know our minds, all sorts of things come up. And we want to talk about how we can help kids, our concrete thinkers, understand what to do with all this stuff that comes up in their heads. How can we explain this to them simply, these complex com concepts? One of the things we do is we talk about animals. 
and we talk about how we have different qualities inside of us that are like different animals. And some of them are scary, some of them are funny, some of them are soothing, some of them are wise, some of them are compassionate, some of them point us toward the way that makes us our best selves, some of us not so much all the time. So there's a whole menagerie of different qualities that all of us have in our head, and they're all okay. They're all just part of being human. But we're gonna talk about a few qualities right now that we really hope to develop in ourselves as adults and in the children themselves. And these qualities are mindful awareness, wisdom, compassion, our watchdog, otherwise known as our nervous system, and patience. So when I talk about mindful awareness, I'm talking about the mindfulness part, which is a stance of attention. And it's a stance of attention where we know where our mind is and our state of mind in real time. So right now, I am highly focused because my nervous system, my watchdog, is a little bit on high alert. I was wondering, is there a little dangerous here? Can I really humiliate myself in front of all these people and on the video camera? So that's got my nervous system up, so that's a good thing in a way. Because remember, we have to have some nervous system stimulation to be at our best and to be alert, right? So we want some, but we just don't want to topple over. So right now, my nervous system is nice and slightly elevated, and my mind is sharp and clear. So that's, I know what I'm focused on, and I know my state of mind. The awareness part is something else. The awareness part can be any one of a number of things, but it looks like in the end, when we tap into our awareness, a quality that's inside all of us, we embody those three qualities we talked about at the beginning of the show, of presentation, attention, balance, and compassion. So mindfulness is a stance of attention where I know where my mind is and my state of mind in real time, right now. And awareness is when I embody these qualities of attention, balance, and compassion. There's another definition of mindfulness that I love, and it's a very simple one too. And it's mindfulness, that mindful stance of attention, knowing where your mind is and your state of mind in real time. When you do embody that stance of attention, when you are mindful, what you can see is the activity of your mind, activity of what's happening within and around you, reflected as if in a clear pool. You see it clearly, you see it with this out distortion, without an added layer of story or projection or all that comes with our thoughts and emotions when they bubble up. Mindfulness is just seeing the activity, what's happening in and around us clearly as a reflection in a pool. So now let's go through these qualities a little bit more specifically. Let's start with the watchdog. We were talking about the watchdog as our nervous system. Some of you may have seen this arousal curve, our general arousal curve, and we talked a little bit about that at the beginning when we are a little bit of stress is great for us. It's called healthy stress. When, it's, when we're at the top of that arousal curve, we're open, we're receptive, we're ready to learn. We have uh, a lot of energy and a wide, wide bandwidth to listen, to learn, to be receptive to new ideas. When that stress or strain or activation gets a little bit too much, we tend to slip over on one side or the other of that arousal curve. We either move into fight, flight, or <coughs> fight or flight or freeze, and we're gonna talk more about that later. The next quality is wisdom. Wisdom is tied into the strategy of seeing and reframing. It's how we can make smart choices, and we play mindful games to help us develop wisdom. Just as the watchdog is tied into the strategies of quieting and focusing, and we, we can play mindful games to help develop those two life skills as well. And then compassion. Compassion is when we're able to take it a little bit easier on ourselves. Self-compassion is an extremely important concept for children and for caregivers, and also in turn take it a little bit easier on other people. And again, this is a quality that can be learned, it can be developed, and it's through mindful games that help develop 
caring and connecting those other life skills on that circle of life skills. Wisdom and compassion in the classical tradition are often described or compared to the two wings of a bird. And the idea is that we need both to be able to fly. So to embody mindfulness and uh, in, out into our real life, to embody, to be slow out in our real life, to be connected with nature out in our real life, we really need the whole thing. We really need the wisdom and the compassion in that whole circle of life skills, focusing, quieting, seeing, reframing, caring, and connecting. Snail is patience. And patience is a great reminder for us. It helps us with our compassion. It helps us with our self-compassion. And it reminds us that this practice of mindfulness, the development of mindfulness, the development of the way of being in the world with attention, balance, and compassion, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It requires patient and gentle and sustained effort, just like our snail right here. And when we tap into these qualities that are inside absolutely all of us, these universal qualities, uh, what we're able to do is we're able to find that compass that points us in the right direction and the lantern that lights the way. So here's the modern problem. Here's the common problem. And here's the reason most teachers, most caregivers come to the practice of mindfulness and meditation. They want help managing meltdowns, they want help managing power struggles, and they want that help fast. And what happens when we're melting down, when the children with us are melting down, is this often we get into this uh, pattern of regulating and co-regulating one another, and that can be an excellent thing, but it also can be when we start ratcheting up each other's you know, um, excitement level, and that's how we become overly excited in these kind of a meltdowns. This is where our watchdog, that watchdog which is very helpful to us because it senses danger, that's its job, where that watchdog can move into fight or flight or freeze or forget it. Now, one of the reasons I like to say forget it when I talk about freeze or forget it, and I think I first heard this from my friend Chris Willard when he was presenting in DC once when we were on the same program, is because forget it is something we often see with our teenagers, right? How many times have you seen this in a classroom? And how many times when you see this in a classroom or on the street or at the kitchen table with your child, and that your response is, oh, this person is defiant. Does that ring a bell for anybody? I think this is a response of defiance. How about if we reframe that? How about every time we see this, we think, wow, he or she is a little overwhelmed. Little too much nervous system activation there, right? He's, he or she's going into the freeze part of the fight, flight, or freeze. That simple reframing all of a sudden helps us lower our shoulders, broaden our perspective, takes us out of our own reactive mode and into one that's more compassionate. What's great about our mindful watchdog is that he or she can be trained just like any other pet. And if we train our mindful watchdog in, watch, in mindfulness, what are the qualities that he or she builds or develops? The first quality that he or she builds or develops is the quality to see clearly and recognize when we truly are in danger. Because this fight, flight, freeze uh, whole um, you know, response gets a bad rap often. It's a very necessary survival mechanism. If our hand gets accidentally in a fire, we don't want to hang out there for a while and use the problem-solving part of our brain to decide whether or not to pull our hand back, right? We want that reactive mode to just take it back. So by training in mindfulness, training in clarity of thought, training in being able to stay in the center of something that's even chaotic and think clearly, which we can train ourselves to do, especially as we get older, a little tough for our very early concrete thinkers, that helps us to recognize, whoops, this really is dangerous, and then to be more reactive and respond appropriately. The other thing that mindfulness does, if it helps us learn these skills to get us into a place that we can think clearly even when we're starting to shift into fight or flight, is it helps us realize, oh, 
maybe this isn't as dangerous as I thought it was. And then it can help us use mindfulness-based quieting strategies. And one of my favorite ones is one that many of you have probably already seen, but you're gonna have to use your imagination and imagine that I have a snow globe in my hand. So let's say I have a snow globe in my hand, just like in this illustration here, and I'm shaking the snow globe for a while. And then I'm gonna talk about how the snow in the globe is a little bit like the activity in our minds the thoughts, the emotions, the sensations that come up. And these activities can be wonderful, but sometimes they cloud our perspective. And then I'll hold the snow globe up and I'll say, can you see through to the other side? And the kids will say, no, I can't. So then I'll ask them to stop, to watch the snow settle, to feel their breathing, relax, lower their shoulders, and to look. And sure enough, soon the snow in the globe will settle. And then you can see through the water and you can see to the other side. So then I do it again and again. Can you see clearly? Yes, I can see clearly. Now watch the stress and strain of mindful life. Uh, I'm sorry, of modern life has a way of, of uh, stirring our thoughts and emotions up, but they can settle. Let's watch and soon we'll be able to see clearly again. Now there's two other really important points about this exercise that I talk to kids and their parents about and their teachers. First, I ask them, is the snow gone in the globe? What do you think? Does the snow completely disappear in the globe? No, the snow remains on the bottom of the globe just as the stress and strain of, every life do, of everyday life does. I wish I could tell you that mindfulness and meditation would get rid of all of our problems and all of our challenges, but it can't. But what it can do is give us strategies that help us settle our minds and bodies so that we can see clearly what's happening within and around us and make smart choices. But then there's another thing I tell kids and I stir it up again. I say, look at the snow. It's kind of beautiful, isn't it? You watch that snow or you watch that glitter fall and it is really, really pretty. That's like the activity of our minds. The activity in our minds can be quite beautiful, but still even beautiful activity, even wonderful excitement can sometimes cloud our perspective. So sometimes even when our thoughts are, are pretty and are beautiful, we still want to settle so that we can see what's happening within and around us clearly. Now the strategy that we're using there is a strategy that is called, we call it a quieting strategy and it uses the focus. So those are two of those life skills in the circle of life skills from the beginning. And it's a strategy where we move our attention away from what we're thinking about to an experience at the moment. And that simple strategy is one of the ways that our minds change our bodies. We can use our mind by moving attention away from worrying about the future or, or, or going over and over and over again the things that is getting us overly excited or upset. We move it into a present moment experience, often a sensory experience, the feeling of my feet against the floor, my bottom against the chair, the sounds in the room, and that has a way of helping our nervous system settle. And that's one of the quieting strategies that we use. If there's one slogan I hope you take away from this program, it's minds change bodies and bodies change minds. Something we often forget. And the superhero pose, there's been some people saying that um, Ann Cuddy did a TED talk, some talk about some science that might support this and there's some question about the science. But I can tell you this is something that kids love. If I sit up straight, if I open my heart, if I make eye contact, if I take on a more expansive posture, then I feel better. And as a result of this, other people then perceive me differently. That was the shift for me that made all the difference. So that's an example of how bodies change minds, right? So we had minds change bodies with a glitter, glitter ball. It helped us settle. Bodies change mind with this kind of superhero pose. Now one other way that minds, might change, minds do change bodies for the skeptics either in the group or in your classrooms or in your families or in your clinic. If you're comfortable, please close your eyes. We, all, we often ask children to close our eyes, a couple general rules, never insist on it. Some kids have very, and adults have very healthy, understandable reasons for not being comfortable closing their eyes around other people, so it's not necessary. But also for the teachers in the room, please keep your eyes open. 
when you're leading the mindful. I mean, I know it's so tempting to close your eyes, but it's so often I hear, oh, but it's, I, you know, it's my practice too, and I need the time to practice. But please, if you're in a classroom, please keep your eyes open while you're leading the mindfulness practice for a bunch of reasons. One is you can see the spitballs and the defiance and the eye rolling, but there's another reason too. And it's important that these practices be trauma-informed. That's one of the reasons we have the movement practices like the shaking practice we had before. But it's also important, one of the important trauma-informed elements of these practices is you keep your eyes open and you watch what's happening in the room. And sometimes you'll see, almost always, if you're with a group of people, somebody will get a little bit restless. Somebody, there might even be a tear that comes up. Somebody might get, you know, feel a little, have some emotions coming up. That's all okay. But if you start seeing the restlessness get to be a little bit more than makes sense, if you start to see a little bit more emotion coming up that makes sense, it then makes sense for a group setting. This is not for the therapists who are working on a one-to-one. In a group setting, then it's time to cut the practice short. It's time to just close it. We're not going to say, oh, I noticed you were crying, so I'm stopping that practice. But it's time to just close the practice. Uh, acknowledge feelings. Sometimes we have <clears throat> strong feelings come up. Sometimes we have happy feelings. It makes sense. And then also circle back at the appropriate time with the child who may have seemed to be having a hard time and check in with them. And then you know where to go from there. Maybe the, refer them to someone to get a little bit more help. Maybe have, talk to them a bit. I mean, you as classroom teachers are all trained in how to work your referral systems in your schools. So. That said, close your eyes if you're comfortable. If you're not, leave your eyes open. And I would like you to imagine for a second that you are in your kitchen and that you are at the counter and that in front of you, you have a cutting board. And on that cutting board is a lemon and is a sharp knife. And the cutting board and the lemon is wet because you just washed it in cold water in the sink. Now I'd like you to, with one hand, pick up the knife, and with the other hand, hold the lemon. And I would like you to feel the weight of the knife in your hand. And now take that knife and just slice into that lemon. Now you've got a half of a lemon in one hand. Put that half down with the wet side up and slice into it again. And just imagine a little bit of that lemon juice comes out. And you feel it on your hand. Maybe it even splashes you in the face. Pick up the wedge of lemon and bring it up and just put it under your nose. Take a whiff. Now open up your mouth and bite into it. I wish you could see the looks on your face. Many, many of you, I can tell, had a mind-body response, right? How many of you felt a little bit of puckering up or salivating? Well, that's one example of how our minds, just thinking about cutting into a lemon, just thinking about biting into a lemon, can make us pucker up or salivate. Think of what other things our thoughts and emotions can do for our bodies. So minds change bodies, and bodies change minds. Another way, another great quieting strategy and a focusing strategy that helps our minds change our bodies and our bodies change our mind is breathing on purpose. Now, this is different from mindful breathing. In mindful breathing, we notice the breath as it moves in and out of our body without changing it, without modifying it. We just notice the breath. This practice, we deliberately emphasize the exhale. So you can do that with one finger up where you breathe in and you imagine that your finger, let's all bring up our, our, um, our, what is that, pointer finger. Imagine that it's a flower, smell the flower. Now your pointer finger has miraculously turned into a candle, blow out the candle. Smell the flower, blow out the candle. Smell the flower, blow out the candle. This slight emphasis on the exhale has a way of settling our nervous system, slowing our, slow, slowing, lowering or slowing down our heartbeat. And yogis and meditators for millennia have known this. Now, if you're working with older kids, 
or adults or yourself, sometimes smell the roses, uh, blow out the candle, you'll get some eye rolls. In that case, breathe in a little bit. Breathe out a whole lot. Breathe in a little bit. Breathe out a whole lot. This type of purposeful breathing is a great quieting. It quiets that watchdog inside of us. It's a calming strategy, just like this one that first responders and people in the military use all the time. It's called box breathing. Let's take your pointer finger. It's helpful, especially with kids, if you, make, if you do things like this in addition to just breathing. So let's do it. We're going to make a box. Let's start in one corner. Breathe in, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. In, hold, out, hold. So those are some exercises where we breathe deliberately, where we breathe on purpose in order to calm an overly excited nervous system or watchdog. This is what we're doing before with the shaking, where we toggle between movement and stillness. A very important uh, idea to keep in mind as far as uh, trauma-proofing your kids, uh, which is a great book by Peter Le Levine, and as far as trauma-informed practices in the classroom. If we have a lot of nervous energy and it's hard to sit still, white knuckling ourselves through it is not often the best thing to do. But we can find ways to release nervous energy in a controlled way like we did with the shaking and then ground ourselves and toggle between the movement and the stillness as a way to release the energy and to settle down. Let me show you a quick way that we do this with young kids. Again, hands on the lap and we're gonna sway from side to side while chanting a rhyme. It goes like this, tick, tock, like a clock, until we find our center stop. And this is a great way also, center is a big word for our little kids and our concrete thinkers, but this is a way for them to get a sense of what we mean when we talk about finding our center through a movement activity. So let's do it together and we're gonna add to it at the end three purposeful breaths, just the way we did earlier today. If I had a bell, I could also ring the bell and we could listen, okay? And if you would like to chant along with me, you're welcome to do so. Tick, tock, like a clock until we find our center stop. or we could ring the bell and listen, and when the sound is gone, when we can't hear it anymore, we raise our hand. We usually repeat that three times. There's something kind of magic about three times in these activities. I, Kimberly, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to research that for us sometime and tell us whether or not there's an evidence base for that, but I can tell you anecdotally, it feels a little magical. Guided visualization is another practice that we do with kids that's very, very helpful. Guided visualization isn't pretending that the world is not the best place, or that the world is a perfect place. Guided visualization is a way that we imagine how we would like the world to be. We imagine that we want the world to be happy and safe and healthy and living in peace. So that is another great practice that we do with kids. And when we do, kids learn to relax. And this is a little bit of what we were hearing about in our slow presentation. We call it the backwards law and how sometimes, sometimes we can do more by doing less. I don't know about you, but when I'm under stress, I tend to settle down, I work it out, I work hard and I get tighter and I get more concentrated. But oftentimes, I have found I can be more effective if I relax. And then when I relax, I'm more natural. My life is less, I'm less contrived. I'm less looking for a special uh, situation, for a special mindset, for something to happen. And I'm better able to accept in the moment what's happening here right now. And with that broader bandwidth, with our nervous system more settled, 
then I'm better able to connect with those universal qualities that we were talking about. Those universal qualities of mindful awareness, of wisdom, of compassion, of patience. These are universal qualities that all of us have in us. They're qualities that can be trained and they're qualities that we can help our kids recognize and develop and grow as early as toddlers. So thank you very much and I really appreciate it. Thank you.